Hello, it's me, Annie. Is Annie even English? No, she's not. Hey there, guys. My name's Megan, if you're new here, and if not, welcome back to Killer Weekend, where each week we'll discuss a true crime case, and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you like all things true crime, then please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Remember, you can now tune in over on Spotify, so please feel free to leave us a big juicy five-star review. I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. It does involve details of violent crime, sexual assault, and the death of a minor. If that's a trigger point for you, then please feel free to turn away now. And remember, if you've nothing nice to say, whatever. Hey there gremlins, it's me, your pal from the north, also known as Ginger Spice. Now, I know this time of year can be just as depressing as Nick Lachey's debut album after the divorce, but it's important to take care of not only your loved ones, but yourselves. And remember, if you ever need anyone to talk to, I always list incredible organisations in the description box. On that note, let's dive in to this week's heartbreaking case. And I will pre-warn you, this one is a toughie and I don't say that very often so if you feel the need to take a break then do you. It is a very difficult one. This case was actually brought to my attention because of all of the amazing victim support work that John Whelan, who is the brother of one of the victims in today's story, has been a part of. Since the murder of his sister Sharon and her two daughters on Christmas morning in 2008, John and the rest of the family have not only been campaigning for improvements in legislation, but they've also been tirelessly fighting to keep Sharon's rape and killer in prison. Yes, due to former Irish prosecution laws, after serving only seven years of a life sentence, Sharon's murderer Brian Hennessy was eligible for parole. He and his team have been lobbying for his release since 2016, and luckily thus far they have been unsuccessful. However, Sharon's family are well aware that it's just a matter of time before this evil individual is able to walk the streets once again as a free man. Thanks to the dedication of families like the Whelans in 2021, the minimum sentence to be served by those charged with murder was up to 12 years. But as we get into the grisly details of this case, I think we will all agree that 12 years is just not enough. Tonight, everyone, we will be discussing the tragic murders of Sharon, Zara and Nadia Whelan. Christmas Day 2008 was meant to be spent around the dinner table with loved ones and opening presents. Instead, Christy Whelan watched on in horror as the remains of his daughter, 30-year-old Sharon, and her two little girls, Zara 7 and Nadia 2, were pulled from their burning farmhouse. The scene was chaotic, with courageous neighbours rushing around doing their best to save anyone who may have still been alive on the property. The local fire service arrived just as the home began to cave in on itself due to the fire blazing on inside. Only a couple of hours before, Sharon's parents had been preparing to go to Christmas Mass with Sharon and the kids. Christy, in complete disbelief, wondered how what should have been a normal festive celebration had turned into the worst day of his life. The proud grandpa visited the quiet farmhouse based in the rural village of Wine Gap in County Kilkenny, Ireland, 
every morning. He would pick Zara up and walk her to school each day. But now, the home once filled with such happy memories looked very different. It looked like a crime scene. Initially, Sharon's four siblings and her parents put Christmas Day on hold, thinking that this had been a terrible accident and that their beloved nieces and grandchildren had perished in a house fire. But when the truth finally came to light during Sharon's post-mortem, the despicable details of this case would ensure that Christy and Nancy Whelan would never celebrate Christmas ever again. Born in 1978, Sharon and her two biological siblings, Linda and David, didn't have the easiest start in life. As a toddler, Sharon was placed into foster care along with her older brother and younger sister. They stayed at St. Joseph's Industrial School until being introduced to a young couple named Christy and Nancy Whelan when Sharon was just four years old. Christy and Nancy, both originally from Ireland, were living and working in London when they met back in the 1960s. Like most people in their early 20s, they spent a lot of their weekends dancing up a storm at the busy public dance halls. Fun fact, my late grandparents also met this way, so I guess you could say it was the bumble of the late 60s. Christy said in a 2021 podcast interview that when he started going out with Nancy, that was when his life began. After dating for a little while, the pair decided to get married and move back home to Ireland. They put down roots in the small village of Wine Gap and started planning for a family. Nancy had always wanted a little girl and was thrilled when she fell pregnant with her eldest daughter, Jacqueline. However, that joy would be tragically short-lived. When baby Jacqueline was 11 months old, she fell ill with a mysterious stomach bug that worsened quickly and took her life within three days. The couple were understandably devastated and emotionally scarred from their sudden loss, but as they always did, they persevered and inspired others with their strength. Even though they could never fill the void left behind by the unexpected death of little Jacqueline, a life without children wasn't for Nancy, and she was again blessed, this time with two boys, John and Paul. Nancy absolutely doted on her two sons, but she still quietly yearned for that unique bond that could only be shared between mother and daughter. She wasn't quite ready to give up on that dream just yet, and so, a few years after the passing of Jacqueline, the couple started looking into adoption. The pain from their loss was of course still fresh, but being the lovely people they are, the Whelans wanted to offer a child the chance of a better life. So, it wasn't long before they were introduced to four-year-old Sharon. The couple had arranged to meet up with Sharon and her social worker at St. Joseph's. They were slightly disappointed to find out she wasn't eligible for adoption due to ongoing circumstances with her birth parents, but they were still happy to foster her for now. Whilst going through the formalities, Sharon briefly mentioned a big brother. When the Whelans pushed the matter, her social worker said that yes, she did have an older brother named David. Well, that was that. Nancy and Christy agreed it would be cruel to separate the two. I mean, you can't take one without the other. And that was the moment when the social worker turned around and said, well, did you know she also has a little sister? Very quickly and within the matter of a year, the Whelans went from a family of four to a family of seven. And Nancy couldn't have been happier. John Whelan later stated that apart from fighting over who slept where, the transition was actually very smooth and it was as if Sharon, David and little Linda had always been there. 
Growing up in Ireland during the Troubles couldn't have been easy for the children, but her loved ones said that Sharon always had a big smile on her face. She was the life and soul of the party and a popular girl with lots of friends. As far as passions go, Sharon wanted to work within the hospitality industry. According to those who knew her, this suit her personality perfectly because during holidays and family parties, she was always on hand to help out, making sure everyone else was having a good time. Big Brother John was sadly missed when he spent his early 20s travelling around America and working in London. But when he finally put down roots back home, Sharon was ecstatic to have him back on Irish soil. She grew up very close to John's wife Sandra and the three would enjoy many a night out in the local pubs listening to live music with a drink in hand. The Whelans were definitely home birds and although some of the kids did travel, they always found their way back to mum and dad's house in County Kilkenny. Now, if you think Nancy and Christy were good parents, then you can't even imagine how amazing they were as grandparents. Poor Sharon hadn't been very lucky in love. However, although she'd been left heartbroken a few times, she didn't regret any of those failed relationships because one, they'd each taught her a valuable life lesson and two, they'd gifted her with two beautiful daughters. Sharon really came into her own as a mum. She was devoted to her children, a quality she probably picked up from Nancy. Her siblings would later say that Sharon lived and breathed for those kids. She never missed a doctor's appointment or pre-arranged outing, her schedule was their schedule. You hear people talking about these women who are just born to be mothers. Well, that was Sharon through and through. Life as a single mother, I'm sure, was challenging at times, but luckily, Nancy and Christy lived just over the road and were always happy to babysit. Christy later told journalist Frank Greeney that he and seven-year-old granddaughter Zara shared a very special bond. They would have full conversations about his life growing up in Ireland and it was clear that we Zara was wise beyond her years. Grandma Nancy said that she can still remember the soft, silky texture of her granddaughter's hair. Every day she would style it into a fishbone braid before Christy dropped her off at school. Everyone in the family agreed that Zara was a lovely little soul. She treated two-year-old sister Nadia like her own baby doll and was always looking out for her. The closeness shared by Sharon, her parents and the girls was a rare gift. And although they weren't blood, it didn't matter because they were family. Raising Sharon, Linda and David, the Whelans never knew if the day would come when they would have to let go and say goodbye. They were never able to officially adopt the kids, but on her 18th birthday, Sharon made the moving gesture of formally changing her surname to Whelan. In the lead up to Christmas 2008, things were of course a bit more hectic than usual. Sharon spent November and early December hunting down every item on Zara's list for Santa. Just a few days before, she'd called her parents all proud of herself for tracking down the very last gift. She'd been storing the presents at her parents' house to stop the girls from accidentally stumbling upon them. Like most mums and dads all around the world, on Christmas Eve night, Sharon was trying to coax her kids into an early bedtime. She knew her dad, Christy, would be dropping off the hidden gifts at around 11pm and she wanted to ensure the girls were fast asleep as to not ruin any of their surprises. Once the glass of milk was poured and Santa's cookies were arranged neatly on a plate, Operation Christmas was in full swing. Nadia and Zara slowly drifted off to sleep in Sharon's bedroom, whilst Christy 
drove over like a modern day Saint Nick to deliver their presents. Sharon was so worried about waking up the children that she made her dad park the car just before the gate at the end of the driveway. He was then instructed to pass each toy through the window as quietly as possible. The drop-off was a success and as her dad drove off, Sharon headed inside, prepared for a long night of wrapping. She wasn't expecting to get much sleep that night. She also wasn't expecting a visit from a vicious killer. Sometime after 7am on Christmas morning, a local farmer and his two sons were doing their usual rounds when they noticed smoke billowing from the house just down the road. Knowing this was the home shared by Shannon Whelan and her two young daughters, the boys bravely raced to the scene. The small farmhouse was completely alight, black smoke pouring out. After contacting emergency services, one of the guys instinctively darted inside the burning building, praying it wouldn't be too late and that whoever was still in there could be saved. Several neighbours heard about the fire and rushed over to help, just as firefighters arrived at the countryside property. Two men joined the young farmer in his rescue efforts and they were able to remove Sharon, Nadia and Zara from the home before the roof caved in. Most of the house was destroyed by the blaze, but first responders were able to extinguish the flames before they tore apart the back bedroom. News of the tragedy quickly filtered through to the Whelans when they received a phone call telling them that there had been a fire. Christy frantically made his way to his daughter's house, unsure as to what would be there when he arrived. It was worse than he could ever have imagined. Exiting the car, his first instinct was to go around the back of the barn in case Shadden and the girls had fled there when the fire first broke out. He was forcibly stopped by some of the residents. He wasn't sure why at the time, but later on, Christy would learn that this was because the lifeless bodies of Sharon and the two girls had been put there until they could be taken away. The men who courageously risked their own lives to save the family of three tried everything to bring back Zara and Nadia, but sadly, they could not be revived. As they carried Sharon from the home, some noted that her body wasn't like that of her children. She was very cold and very stiff. Emergency service workers and the few who tried to assist emerged from the other side of the property, tears in their eyes and shaking their heads. In those moments, Christie's world began to dissolve. His beloved daughter and granddaughters were gone. Was this real life? It couldn't be. In the midst of all the madness, he found himself having to break the news to wife Nancy. The words, they're gone Nancy, they're dead, pierced through her heart like a dagger in the chest. One by one, members of the Whelan family were informed of the tragedy. No one could understand. Sharon was always so careful with candles and turning off the Christmas lights before bed. How had this fire even happened? For two whole days, they believed that their precious Sharon and her little angels had been victims of a horrific accident. No one was prepared for the awful truth. Initially, the bodies were taken to a nearby university, for examination. However, it was discovered that Shannon strangely had no smoke in her lungs. It confirmed the theory of those first on scene that she had died hours before the flames took hold. When she was rescued, her body had no movement and it was apparent she was already in the early stages of rigor mortis. Some even noticed dark bruising on her neck and forearms, Signs that something much more sinister than an unfortunate house fire had taken place. Because of the mounting red flags surrounding the deaths, forensic pathologist Dr Marie Cassidy 
was brought in to perform a post-mortem. Dr Cassidy was a force of nature within a very male-dominated field. If anyone could get to the bottom of this, it was her. Back at home, as the Whelan family tried to pick up the pieces left in the wake of this heinous incident, they were informed that the deaths of Sharon, Nadia and Zara were no longer being treated as an accident. This revelation once again put their lives into a tailspin. John, Sharon's brother, said that the days that followed were just a complete blur. He's been asked many times what that Christmas was like for the family, but he always replies, I honestly don't know. I wasn't there at all. Things were very different that year in Wind Gap. Parties were cancelled and a sense of dread hung in the air, but no one knew that the worst was yet to come. According to Dr. Marie Cassidy's findings, Sharon and her daughters had been subjected to a cruel Christmas execution. Sharon was sexually assaulted before being strangled. Defensive marks on her arms showed that she fought back fearlessly before being overpowered by her attacker. Whoever did this to her had intentionally set fire to the home to cover his tracks, killing both Zara and Nadia in the process. The two young girls died of smoke inhalation, falling asleep on Christmas Eve, never to wake up. Again, Christy and Nancy were dealt another devastating blow. Hearing that their beautiful daughter had been murdered whilst wrapping presents for her children. The Guard D, who are the local Irish authorities, were able to shed more light on what had taken place on the evening of December 24th, 2008. Several piles of burnt clothing had been found amongst the rubble, which proved that the killer had set a few small fires around the home in order to help the flames spread. Because the perpetrator took such care in destroying any evidence left behind at the scene, investigators believed that this may be someone who lived nearby, who was known to Sharon and her family. This new development killed the Whelans. Thinking someone that they know could have done this meant that they were constantly looking over their shoulders unsure as to who they could trust. Everybody knew everybody in Wine Gap. It was just that kind of town. Was this person watching them, taking pleasure in every minute of their misery? It was New Year's Day when Sharon, Nadia and Zara were finally laid to rest at St Nicholas's Cemetery, nestled between the farmhouse and the home shared by Nancy and Christy. Members of the community gathered as two tiny white coffins were carried into the church. A kamogi stick was placed nearby, a symbol of Zara's love for hurling, something she often did with Grandpa Christy. Nadia's favourite teddy bear was there too. The large turnout was a reflection of how loved the young mum and her two girls were. No one could quite believe that such a horrid event had taken place in their wee Irish town. Many families attended the funeral in order to pay their respects to Nancy, Christy and Sharon's siblings. Sharon's closest relatives formed a receiving line outside the chapel, shaking hands with those who left. Christy recalled having to switch hands at one point because of all of those who'd squeezed his in solidarity as they passed by. Others thought about what they'd recently been told by the guardee. If Sharon's murderer was someone local, was it possible they were in attendance today? Had Nancy unknowingly shaken hands with her daughter's rapist and killer? In the days that followed the fire, men in the area were asked to provide a sample of their DNA. The first intake started with those who were present on the scene that day 
to help narrow down the search. Afterwards, investigators widened their net to men who were known to Sharon and who may have been in the area at that time. Thanks to those bold few who dashed into the burning farmhouse to rescue Sharon and her daughters, DNA evidence that was minutes away from being destroyed was saved. Gardi knew they had to act quickly. They feared that her murderer may have already fled until they got an unexpected hit. The seminal fluid discovered was a DNA match to 23-year-old postman Brian Hennessy. Now, Brian didn't really know Sharon, but he delivered her mail several times a week and was an acquaintance of her father through the local hurling club. Nancy went to high school with his mother and said that they were a lovely family very warm and friendly. In fact, whilst growing up in Wind Gap, she recalled that Brian's grandmother always handed out snacks and drinks for the kids playing in the street. When the news travelled that Brian could have potentially done this, the Whelans couldn't believe it. He was a nice local boy from a nice family. He had no reason to take their daughter's life away. Gardy brought Brian in for questioning, wanting to go over his whereabouts. He seemed very calm and as if he was willing to help in any way he could. He told investigators that he'd worked the night shift on December 23rd in the sorting office and then headed home on Christmas Eve morning at around 8am, where his mother then sent him out to pick up the turkey for the next day's festivities. It had been his birthday on the 23rd, but because of how busy work had been, he hadn't had a chance to go out and celebrate. So, after running a few errands, which included a trip to visit his then-girlfriend, Brian headed to a bar named Keitler's Inn in nearby Kilkenny Town Centre. At 8pm, Brian, his two siblings and father travelled back to Guinan's pub in Wind Gap, where they stayed until closing at about 1am. During his day of binge drinking, which wasn't an uncommon practice for Brian, he told several people that he was going to have sex tonight. His partner at the time was busy that evening with her family and friends, and looking at Brian, it's easy to see he was no prize. So just who exactly was he planning on hooking up with? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Brian, the piece of dog shit that he is, wasn't in fact looking to have sex. No, he was instead looking to rape someone. After a quick pit stop at his mother's house, Brian left under the pretense that he'd left something back at Guinan's and had to go and get it. Eyewitnesses would later tell authorities that they saw an intoxicated Brian stumbling down the road towards the pub. But Brian would never arrive because he decided to take a detour to the home of single mother Sharon Whelan. As Sharon finished up the last few bits and bobs for Christmas morning, she had no idea that her two gorgeous little girls would never open their gifts that year. She also had no idea that a dangerous predator was making his way towards her home. At first, Brian fabricated a story in which Sharon had willingly invited him over for a late night rendezvous, something that was quickly debunked by investigators. He tried to insinuate that they'd met up at her house for casual and consensual sex, but without getting too graphic here, the extensive tissue damage and bruising on Sharon's body proved he could only have taken her by force. When that didn't go down too well, he changed his version of events once again, claiming that after they had sex, Sharon threatened to tell his girlfriend and parents about it. Brian said that at that point he snapped and strangled Sharon to shut her up for good. However, he conveniently denied any involvement in the fires that were set or the deaths of Nadia and Zara. 
Gardee knew that Brian was spinning a nasty web of lies and with the DNA evidence and his own admission that he was in the area at the time, they pieced together what they believed truly took place that night. Ryan, who was from a good family that were well respected in the community, had no history of violent behaviour, but he did, according to friends, have an insatiable appetite for women and alcohol. He would talk about sex in very graphic and crude terms, even in front of his parents and siblings. He treated his girlfriends like objects and saw no issue with being unfaithful. On the night that Sharon was murdered, Brian mentioned several times that he was out on the prowl for sex, consensual or not. He left his family home still drunk from the night's festivities and at some point clocked Sharon's quiet little farmhouse off in the distance. He knew she would be home alone with her two girls as he delivered mail to that address many times and so he decided to strike while she was at her most vulnerable. The single mum was probably doing what every parent does on Christmas Eve, trading sleep for wrapping gifts. At some point, Brian forced his way into the home and attacked Sharon, finally overpowering her near the kitchen. Nadia and Zara remained fast asleep throughout the assault and after choking their mother for several minutes, Brian remained in the home pacing back and forth. For at least two hours, he walked around contemplating his next move before placing Sharon's corpse, now nude from the waist down, on the same bed her little girls slept in. He wandered the home, setting small fires as he went, hoping this would destroy any physical evidence that could tie him to the murders. He never once thought about the lives of Sharon's children. He was only thinking of himself. Zara and Nadia went to bed that night, excited to see what Santa had left them the next morning. But sadly, they went to sleep and never woke up. As they lay out for the count, the smoke from the fires slowly snuck into their airways and they died shortly after. The only saving grace was that they never woke up to the sounds of their mother being brutalised. So they just quietly slipped away. Brian Hennessy was arrested on the 18th of January 2009 and charged with the murders of Nadia, Zara and their mum Sharon. The trial was horrific. No parent should ever have to listen to what Nancy and Christy had to. The prosecution painted Brian as an evil creep who was both sadistic and opportunistic. The night he decided to rape and murder Sharon, he didn't stop to think about the effect that would have on those around her. These were people he knew well. Like I said, Wind Gap is a very tight-knit wee place and he even attended the funeral of his three victims with his own family. Brian was cold and callous. He never once showed any form of emotion during his conversations with the guardie. The coroner deduced that Sharon had died sometime around 2am and the fires were set a few hours later. This meant that Brian had plenty of time to come to his senses, but instead he chose to potentially burn two young girls alive whilst the remains of their partially nude mother lay nearby. Sharon knew the postman to wave hello to on the street, but he was nothing more than a distant acquaintance. He had no reason to want the single mum dead. He just decided on a whim to rape and murder an innocent mother that evening, which is absolutely terrifying. And I have zero doubts that if the fire had spread and he'd gotten away with this, 
that he would have done it again. Nancy doesn't hold the Hennessys responsible for Brian's actions. It would seem as though he had everybody fooled, even his closest friends. A truly psychopathic individual. I'm sure everyone in Wind Gap had hoped that this was just some random stranger passing through. No one expected that one of their own could have committed such a despicable act. This was no accident, no violent crime of passion. Brian stumbled over to the rural farmhouse that night with one thing on his mind. He was then able to enjoy a completely happy normal Christmas dinner with his family and girlfriend. In the aftermath of the killings, he carried on business as usual, attending Sharon's funeral and chatting casually with fellow residents about the deaths. As if that wasn't enough of an indicator of the kind of man Brian Hennessy is, he then based his whole criminal defence on the annihilation of Sharon's character. She was a dedicated single parent. She never invited strange men back to the house and she would never have touched someone like Brian. He dragged out the legal process only to plead guilty at the last minute. He put her family through hell. And for what? Justice Barry White chastised Brian for waiting so long to change his plea, stating that his decision to do so had re-traumatised the Whelans all over again. Throughout the trial and his sentencing, 23-year-old Brian showed no remorse. He only began to cry when he was sentenced to three life terms behind bars. Outside the courthouse, members of the Whelan and Hennessy families wept and hugged one another, two households destroyed by one man's unforgivable actions. To Christy, Nancy and Sharon's four siblings, the verdict was just. Three life sentences for three lives. So you can imagine their heartache when this was later overturned. UK and Irish law states that in cases that involve multiple murders at the same time and by the same hand, the judge may hand down more than one life sentence, but that those sentences must run at the same time. So, essentially, it seems like he was serving three life terms but actually only doing jail time for one. This means that someone like Brian Hennessy could be paroled in as little as 12 years despite receiving such a lofty sentence. Understandably, Sharon's loved ones and close friends were enraged by the update, which they actually heard through the grapevine and not from local Gardaí. The family felt let down by the courts to say the least and turned to Judge Barry White for answers. John, Sharon's brother, asked why such a sentence was given in the first place if he knew it would just be overturned at a later date. Justice White simply stated because it was the right sentence for those crimes. Which is true. Three lives should result in three life terms. In what world is seven years served justice for killing three innocent people, two of whom were children? At the age of two, Nadia, who suffered from some developmental issues, was just starting to get up on her feet. This man killed a baby in cold blood and the punishment does not fit the crime at all. Since the murders, things legally have improved slightly, but we are still miles behind other western parts of the world judiciously. Of course, I understand that the prison system is about reform and reintroduction, but in this particular case, I don't think he can come back from something so disgusting. This man doesn't deserve a second chance. He deserves to live out the rest of his days in a tiny cell knowing every day exactly why he's in there. Brian Hennessy now awaits the day when he'll be able to go back home. The Whelans too wonder when that day will come. Sharon's siblings often think about Brian's shortened sentence and question 
Which life taken does it represent? Whose murder is he serving that single life sentence for? In the aftermath of their deaths, John Whelan, a licensed therapist and support counsellor, has fought hard to better the resources out there for victims of violent crimes and their families. He has done some incredible work with associations such as Advocates for Victims in Homicide, known as ADVIC, and has since become a chairperson for the SAVE organisation for sentencing and victim equality. John feels as though the decision of whether someone should remain in prison or not should be something that is discussed with those directly affected by the crimes in question. He says, and I completely agree, that it makes no sense to have three faceless strangers make that choice without really looking into the history of the offender. If families and those impacted by violent crime were to have some sort of input, I think the justice system would have a lot less ex-cons out in the streets reoffending. The Whelans have done everything they can to ensure that Shadden and the girls did not lose their lives for nothing, but the sting of their loss cannot be overlooked especially around the month of December. Every day, of course, was difficult, but Christmas was practically unbearable. Christy and Nancy never miss a trip to the cemetery to pay their respects, and Christmas Day is no exception. En route, they pass by homes aglow with twinkling lights and tinsel-covered trees, but it's a ritual that Nancy and her husband will not partake in this year or next. For them, Christmas has forever been tainted. Back then, it was the best time of their year, and now that seems like a different life, one where Sharon and the girls live on. No one should ever have to bury a child, but the thought of a papa burying his two granddaughters is unthinkable. The Whelans will never stop speaking out on behalf of their fallen girls, but underneath their bravery is a festering wound that will never heal. Sharon and her daughters weren't the first to lose their lives to a violent criminal, and as much as it kills me to admit, they obviously will not be the last. So tonight, I ask you to share their story. Get the word out there and ensure that from this point on in the UK and Ireland, life means life. Nadia, Sharon and Zara won't get to open their Christmas presents next year. So why should Brian Hennessy? I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to hit that notification bell. It really helps this wee channel of mine. If you have any case suggestions, please send those directly to me at megankillerweekend at gmail.com. Do you enjoy the spookier side of life? Then please check out our new fact or fiction horror podcast, Here She Lies, via the link in the description box below. Once again, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to every one of you who tune in each week and also to all of the amazing families who allow me to share their stories. I love all of you so, so much. So please remember to lock your doors, don't talk to strangers and also don't try and dry your hair in the bath. See ya! <laughs> Bye.